Namaskar and good evening to all. Today we are going to have our fifth lecture in the ongoing Shri Dante Pant Tegri lecture series organized by the Adhivakta Parishad. We all know this is unprecedented time from school colleges to shopping malls, from government offices to courts, all are either closed or working with their minimum capacity. And as the old saying goes, we learn more in the time of crisis than in the comfort. Therefore, through this lecture series, our endeavor is to make productive use of this time and discuss current and important legal issue with our advocate brothers and sister. Yesterday, we had Ms. Pinky Ananji with us and what a beautiful virtual lecture it was. Today, we have very well-known senior lawyer, Shri Rakesh Divedi ji with us. Although, sir needs no introduction, but as a tradition of this ongoing lecture series, I need to say something about the speaker. And therefore, I want to say a few words about Sir. Sir was born in Allahabad and completed his graduation from Allahabad University in 1972. Sir completed his law from Delhi University in 1975. Sir, father, S.N. Divedi ji, was not only a noble jurist, but was also a judge in Allahabad and Honorable Supreme Court. Coincidentally, landmark judgment of the occasion on Bharti, which changed the public discourse our country, has been pronounced exactly 47 years before on this date. And Sir Father, who was then a judge of the Supreme Court, was also a part of 13 judges bench who pronounced this order. He practiced 22 years before the Allahabad High Court and was also additional advocate general of the Uttar Pradesh. In 1997, upon his designation as a senior advocate, he shifted to Delhi. And from that time, he has been practicing before the Honorable Supreme Court. It has been almost 23 years since he has practicing before the Supreme Court. Sir is considered as an expert in the field of constitution and civil laws. And in the past, he represented election commission and UIDAI authorities before Supreme Court in many high profile cases. Apart from being an excellent lawyer, Sir is also a good cricketer. He represented Uttar Pradesh before many Danji matches. So this was the professional achievement of the Sir. But whenever society at large needed Sir support in a difficult situation like this, he never hes hesitated to contribute with everything he could for the good of many. Sir always believed that helping those in the need is not charity, but a humanity. And therefore, Sir has contributed rupees 1 crore to PM Cares Fund. Sir also given 5 lakh each to Tamil Nadu and Kerala CM Relief Fund. Sir has also given 5 lakhs to Supreme Court Advocate on Record Association. Sir has also donated 15,095 masks to Ames Delhi, worth rupees many 27 lakhs. With this note, definitely these are the big numbers. And it big number shows big how big his heart is. On this note, we commence today's lecture. If you have any question, please write in the comment box. We will try to put it before Lakesh Divedi ji as much as possible. Now I would request sir to commence this lecture. Namaskar, Vannakam, Salam Alaikum, Satsriyakar. Welcome all friends to this virtual world, to this conference being held to this uh, on the virtual world in the name of Dattopan Thegdi ji. He is well known, a stalwart, a good lawyer, and we have been watching the growth of Adivakta Parishad under his ages earlier and subsequently also it has grown by leaps and bound and rendering good service to the society and even pro bono service. Friends, looking at the topic rights and duties of lawyers in COVID-19 period. The first duty of mine is to inquire whether all of you are well, safe, hale and hearty, staying at home, 
and following the norms. For this battle against Corona is a battle which India has to fight unitedly as one. However, in this fight against Corona, we find very interesting developments taking place and the focus of the society shifting to duties as well. So rights, we have been stressing all the time and we as lawyers are used to talking about rights all the time. Whether we challenge statutes, whether we challenge executive orders and whether we want benefits for our clients, it is rights, rights and rights. But times come in our life when we have to think about duties. And Corona has drawn our attention to several aspects which we need to learn from this battle which is going on. For example, we recently learned that the water of Ganges, which is flowing in uh, Haridwar, has become so pure that it is drinkable now because of the lockdown, because there are hardly any people dirtying the water of River Ganga. Therefore, we have clean water. So, Namami Gange movement is happening as a result of Corona. But what is the message? The message is that we are so obsessed with exercising our rights and fulfilling our desires that we have not bothered about the environment. We have, as a humanity, there has been destruction of forests, there has been pollution in the race for cars and motorcycles, the roads are flooded, we cannot even move there, there's pollution, we cannot breathe. So, but now you see in Delhi also, the air is breathable, the environment is improving, the waters are improving. So the lesson is that along with our rights, we should equally be and rather more concerned about duties as all our religions, whether it is Hinduism, Islam or Christianity, all of them have stressed morality, ethics, <coughs> duties, whether it is duties in worship, duties for, towards family, duties towards parents, duties towards children. Everything is talked about. The whole law of karma is talked about in terms of duties. Our constitution of India is no different. Yes, there is part three which emphasizes rights. <coughs> but we equally find that there are so many articles, even before the amendment of constitution and introduction of article 51A, which is dedicated to specification of duties for all citizens. There are other provisions which were already there which talked about duties. So this right and duties combination is absolutely necessary for the societies to develop. Now, when we look at the perception of right, the perception of duty, their interrelation and their dynamism, these are aspects which need to be considered by us today. Now, we as lawyers, even before the constitution was made during the freedom struggle, we have fought for the rights of the people of India. It was the lawyers who led from the front and gained independence. Mahatma Gandhi was a lawyer, Jawaharlal Nehru was a lawyer, Dr. Ambedkar was there and so many others. The framing of the constitution, again, the lawyers were in the forefront. Even post-constitution, we find that when legislations were made, then there were legal battles in the courts and we had a long journey from earlier cases to Golaknath, from Golaknath to Keshwanand Bharti, whose, in which case the judgment was delivered coincidentally today, 47 years back. And Bharti to Rajendra Ryan versus Indira Gandhi and then 
to IR Polo and so many other cases of basic structure. The route taken by Golaknath was different. The constitutional amendments to protect agrarian reforms, which alterations in property rights were under challenge. The route taken there was that an amendment is a law under Article 13, and therefore it must stand the test of Part 3 of the Constitution. So like an ordinary law, the constitutional amendment also has to stand the test of Part 3. When we come to go to Keshwanand Bharati, then we find that Golaknath on the one hand is overruled, but at the same time, the ultimate conclusion that constitutional amendment has to stand the test of fundamental rights and other basic features remained and in fact it was strengthened not only fundamental rights but other basic features in the constitution cannot also be destroyed they may be amended in public or public interest but they cannot be destroyed emasculated that is the basic structure which emerged and in Kolo, we find that the fundamental rights have been elevated to the level of natural rights, inherent rights. So today the rights are entrenched. But the question is, look at whether you look at Article 14, you look at Article 19 or 21, we find that inherently there is a play between rights and duties in each of these articles the first element of the of every fundamental right is that my right stops where your right begins so therefore you cannot exercise your right so as to harm or hurt another person or to destroy his right i cannot exercise my fundamental right to free speech and expression under article 191a so as to abuse, so as to insult, so as to defame. So therefore, these there are inherent limitations. It is my duty. While I exercise my right to freedom of speech, it is my duty to ensure that no harm is done to another person. You come to Article 19.1b, right to associate freely, peaceably, and, and uh, without arms. What does it indicate? Just look at this particular article. Expressly a right is woven with a duty. You have a right to assemble anywhere of your choice, but you have a duty to be peaceful, non-violent, and without arms. So a right is interwoven with a duty in the fundamental right itself. And this is quite apart from the laws which the state can make imposing reasonable restrictions. So similarly, you find that there are certain duties which are in the form of fundamental rights. Article 17, untouchability has been abolished, though we still find untouchability uh, in various forms. They are prevailing in the country, which is unfortunate after 70 years. But still, this is a duty of every citizen in the country, every person in this country to ensure, because this is an offense. And we have to ensure that this untouchability is done away with, because unless the downtrodden and Dalits are emancipated, the society's development will be hampered. So therefore, the idea was to uplift everybody give them political as well as social equality as the preamble says, economic equality as the preamble says. Therefore, this, this is now a fundamental right of the Dalits, but at the same time, it is a duty of all other people to ensure that they stop practicing untouchability. So again, we find a right which is interwoven with a duty. Similarly, children cannot be subject, uh, used for giving labor in factories if they are of less than 14 years of age there can't be forced labor article 23 so this in substance what i wish to say is 
that rights and duties work together they are not separate values often rights indicate that there is a corresponding duty often rights are themselves in the form of duty so therefore when our prime minister had laid emphasis during the the battle where the, when this corona battle the lockdowns etc started then he emphasized that it is time that we start the countrymen thought about duty some news media people thought that this is a shift away from fundamental rights as if the fundamental rights are going to be taken away no it it is really an emphasis on the combination of right and duties a proper balance between the two if the duties are not taken care of then the rights result in anarchy then the rights result in pollution then the rights result in destruction of forests destruction of rivers and ultimately our health our right to life our personal liberty so just see how duty and rights unless they are considered together our development will be the way it has been happening so that it was the right emphasis on duty now the question is rights and duties in normal times and rights and duties in times which are not normal times which are of a nature of emergency like a war or a tsunami or like this pandemic which is nationwide rather global so therefore again another important aspect is to note the dynamism of this the content of the right the shift of emphasis these right and duties concept are relatable to the space time and conditions in which they are to operate if it is normal times it is justifiable to lay great emphasis on fundamental rights and rights because if all the citizens of this country exercise their rights together collectively individually in even in the interest of their own development we will find that the contribution results in the development of the nation as a whole so creativity results with well exercise of rights so in normal times the rights have a greater play dominant play and it is perfectly all right to over emphasize even the play of rights the giving effect to the rights and the states must take interfere with the rights as little as possible only when public interest justifies and in compliance with the test of proportionality which was emphasized by a bench of nine judges in the adhar case and in modern dental case so therefore but when we, the times change and the times are like one of emergency like this pandemic corona pandemic then if we talk of rights that look i have, this town has been locked down and we are required to stay at home i have a fundamental right under 19 to travel throughout the territory of india i can speak anything i can assemble anywhere i can settle anywhere so therefore if we everybody starts doing this then the battle of corona is lost so in such times which are abnormal times the focus of the whole country would shift from rights to duties the rights are not lost in entirety the rights still exist the right of the migrant laborers to be fed by the state by the people of this country who can afford to spare something sacrifice something of of some of their prosperity so they their their rights are still in play they need shelter governments have to take care of it that's one part of it but 
the duty part has taken over. Now look at it, that in one particular battle against Corona, different sections of the society are required to share different kind of responsibilities and duties. In the forefront, instead of the army, we find the army of doctors. And the doctors are fighting to save us. The, they treat the patients despite the risk to their own lives. Now, doctors cannot say that it's my life, Article 21. Why should I go there? I must save myself. But I must admire and applaud the white warriors in coming forward, taking the risk and treating the COVID patients and other patients also to the best of their capacity, notwithstanding that there are difficulties and shortages. Still, the whole country applauds these doctors, these white warriors, and the support, the hospital staff who are supporting them. Equally, there are other people who are not taking so much risk, but still are taking some lesser risk. Those who are supplying essential services, they are coming every day from their house and they are sitting in their shops. They are retailing essential goods to the, to the members of the society, to the colony people, without which we cannot survive. So they are taking risk so that we may survive. That's the duty which they are performing. Likewise, the policemen, very difficult job but they are going out. They can't see their families. They can't go home. Many of them have to stay out. Many of them get inflicted with the disease, but then they are doing this. So that each section has a different duty. What is the duty of us lawyers and other citizens? We as lawyers, of course, courts are not functioning. That doesn't mean that we go to sleep or, or we complain about boredom or psychological issues or, or keep thinking what will happen, the economy is going down and so on. We also have to play a vital role. Those lawyers who can afford, they can contribute to the Prime Minister Cares Fund, Chief Minister's Care Fund, to the various organizations, NGOs who are helping to feed the poor or they can themselves organize food for the poor. In fact, Justice Bhatt of Supreme Court, he himself personally had gone to give food to the poor people, the migrant laborers. So therefore, these are grave, ex great examples. And I'm sure a lot of you are doing these services, you are going to the various parts which are near you and wherever you are finding you are giving rations dry rations foods and shelter and whatever different kind whatever one can do the question is not who is doing how much but it's a duty you have to do it and you have to explain people the foremost task of you is to tell them to comply with all the norms now so we are all COVID warriors in some sense. It's not that like in all actual war which the army fights, there are people who are wearing the guns, there are people who are flying the fighter planes, there are those in the Navy who are in the ships, fighter ships, and there are also those who are helping the army from behind. There are also the citizens of this country who stand as one with, behind the army to boost their morale and to provide whatever support they can do. People donate whatever they can do. So therefore, this is a war where the duties have come forward in focus and the rights take back seat. In order that we defeat this corona, come out victorious, 
and rebuild the economy, we need to carry out this national duty which has been cast upon us, which we are told to do by the government. This is not the time for politicking. One may have different views. One may have reasons to find fault. In the smallest of affairs of our home sense, right, we find that if we have to do something, there are defects, there are problems. This is not the time to talk about it. Yes, of course, criticize whatever you can point out, how it can be strengthened. Criticism should be constructive. These are the duties. Criticize, but constructively. Exercise of free speech, of constructive criticism. Not for the sake of politicking or for damaging the war, spreading rumors, collecting migrants so that a problem is created. We found, I don't want to mention, many incidents have happened where people violated the directions and that also contributed to quite an extent in the increase of virus cases. So the duty has become foremost and it is dynamic, as I said. Now look at it, the moment the government decides to open up the economy and slowly the factories start working, the workers start going there, it's a situation, catch-22 situation. If you extend lockdown too long, we will be short of food, we will be short of other products, and there will be more unemployment, more laborers who will be laid off. The economy as such as is being predicted, we are going to face difficult times. But that is not to depress ourselves. That is not to lapse in pessimism. We will fight Corona and we will fight to build the economy of this country. That is what our intent should be. Fight Corona and build the economy later on. We will suffer, we will bear, but we will build the economy of the country and take the country forward. Now, and when the time comes, when the lockdowns are lifted more and more, you will see that the duties will shift from the hospitals to the factories. The businessmen and the workers, they will become the warriors. Hence, I say that we are all COVID warriors. And it is our duty now to exercise our rights in a manner that we don't lose sight of the, do the dominant aspect that is fulfilling the national duty and seeing that the nation stands united as one. So friends, there is one more aspect about which I would wish to speak with you. And that is, we have been noticing that there is an element of fear psychosis being built up. The director of AIMS, Dr. Goleria, has spoken and written about it, that society is not treating the COVID white warriors, the doctors and the nursing staff with sympathy, with empathy. While they are fighting, we are finding that those landlords are asking them to leave. Those living in the colony, they are treating them as outcasts and they feel that they will spread the virus. Now, what is this kind of discrimination which we are, we all the time talk of discrimination by state, invoking Article 14. So, Article 14 may not apply when we are doing something, but what about morality? What about ethics? What about duties? What about Article 51A? Can we fight this war without the doctors? So therefore, empathy is needed towards them. Then there are also another section of people who have been inflicted this disease, unfortunately. And they have been treated, they have become well, and they are coming out of the hospital. And when they go back, then they are treated as if they are carrying a stigma. So 
it is important to understand and the lawyers must come to the forefront to advocate the cause of these people let us applaud these people let us welcome them let us support them let us show them that we are one family it's not merely a slogan ki hum ek parivar hain agar hum ek parivar hain to humko inki raksha karni chahiye hame khushi honi chahiye ki hamare bhai theek ho kar ke wapas aa gaye ki hamare bhai apni jaan ko zokhe mein dal ke desh ki seva kar rahe hain kai jagah doctors log mohallon mein gaye hain to un par patharav kiya gaya hai so let us not sit at home lawyers friends let us utilize whatever uh, we have the social media or the telephones or in whichever way we can send this message that we must rise as a humanity this is what humanity is we cannot talk of this and at the same time act in a inhuman way what what why should we talk at all about human rights when we can't ourselves can act human humanely with empathy if we can't respect them in fact it's not empathy we owe them respect we owe them our love so let's stand in solid support let's understand the change in times and the dynamic nature the shift of the right and duty correlation nothing stands at one point it will keep on so we must understand this only then we will be able to fight this war and the lawyers have a important job to do you can write articles pamphlets and so many things can be done so please do all that you can do contribute as much as you can the smallest of contribution is big what i have contributed it's too small the important thing is that everybody contributes according to his capacity whatever surpluses he has whatever he can afford he should contribute and if everybody does it they are your contributions don't think in terms of small and big a contribution is a contribution if a one meal provided is as big so please come forward join hands with all forces and let's come out victorious uh, thank you sir thank you sir a uh, lot of our viewers are putting their questions and comments simultaneously so with the, your permission i would like to put some of their questions before you yes yes welcome uh, sir uh, uh, advocate gitanshi arora she is asking that uh, you said right and duties are, you know go together uh but duties are not enforceable under law so how will you know how can we regulate those duties no so duties may not be enforceable as such in court of, I, what i am talking is about the corona, life and rights and duties in times of corona so we are human beings we don't need courts to tell us what due what are our duties and what we should do let us enforce our duties we must understand first question is of understanding the duties and secondly once you comprehend the duties you will always find some fundamental right on which it can be pitched hinged as i said many fundamental rights are supportive of duties so the first question uh, answer is that it is time to for us to understand duties not enforcement let us enforce the duties ourselves let us carry out our duties ourselves and then we'll find
sports cannot fight corona why should we think in terms of enforcing the right in courts supposing you go to court and say that something has gone wrong somewhere what will the court do and we are finding so many pils have been filed and the court said court is not a panacea for all problems much less in corona so judicial review has will be very minimal during such emergencies so my emphasis was that now as the prime minister also said that we must realize the point is that the realization of duty is missing that's why we are beating the doctors we are, we are thinking that they will spread corona we are not helping and supporting those patients who are cured this is the purpose of my reference to the shift to duty okay uh so this this second question has come from mr achutandr singh baghel he is asking that constitutional framework provides uh three pillars of democracy legislative is working executive is working and uh, media is also working what about the judiciary what should be the role of judiciary in this time whether we should open our courts and what kind of restriction we should put on the lawyers who are you know who comes to court so i have already written a letter to the honorable the chief justice that uh, we can't keep the courts shut for too long how long is a question which the court will have to decide on its own but my suggestion was that do everything to about avoid crowding constitute less number of benches for example there could be three constitution benches and six benches for uh, of three judges to deal with matters list fewer number of cases let's say 15 or 20 cases every day so let's start off with some functioning let's close the canteen let's close the library let's close the chambers and lawyers should come with minimum numbers and do their cases and go back home so there no, should be no crowding in the court we should wear mask we should wear gloves and in any case judges are as such sitting quite far from the lawyers so lawyers cannot pass on the disease to the judges but yes there will be a pro some problem with the court staff some logistics will have to be worked out how they will come from home how they will go back from home but these are not very difficult issues some special buses can run to carry them to the court and uh, the judges can meet uh, one or two of them which who are necessary but something has to be worked out whether it is on 3rd of may or 10th of may i can't say which is because it's for uh, the inputs which the court gets from the government and other places and see whether the time has come but for sure there so many fronts which are working the courts cannot be silent as lord atkins had said that amidst the clash of arms the laws are not silent i would say that amidst the pandemic the laws are not silent and the court should not go to sleep this emergency cases in uh, internet um, urgent cases i don't think that's an answer but then slowly it will it will come back to life i'm sure about it so this question has come from dr bhutesh kumar sangwan he is saying that how can a lawyer help government in bringing justice to the people who are spitting and attacking on the corona warriors rajesh kumar sangwan is asking this question lawyers can help not by approaching the institution but by educating the government is doing its job government has coming out with laws to support the doctors to to take action there some fines have been imposed for spitting and so on so government is doing its job it is for us the problem is that we are all the time looking at the government and the courts but we are not looking inwards antyoday apne andar dekhe pehle hum how in normal life we do 
वी आर हैप्पी टू थ्रो द कूड़ा दूसरे के घर के सामने या टेक द डॉग्स टू अदर पर्सन होम एंड इन फ्रंट ऑफ दर गेट्स सो देर सो मेनी थिंग्स वी आर वी थ्रो पेपर्स हेयर एंड देयर लिटरिंग अराउंड so we we have these are things which of culture let's talk about culture let's improve ourselves that's the duty which the prime minister talked of so yes, one more quote uh, uh, mr alad uh, singh malik has asked sir what is the constructive criticism and what is its basis well constructive criticism means that if you think that some government is doing something wrong or some official is doing something wrong then you don't don't merely say that it is wrong you have to tell him the alternative and the alternative should be such which is sustainable you say it doesn't matter that it's not accepted or accepted every time some because we are 1.3 billion people if everyone will give suggestions then it's not possible that everybody's ideas will be accepted but that's what constructive criticism is that criticism not for the criticism sake that this is not in order and you go quiet if that is not in order what the government is doing what other thing should be done that's what i mean by constructive criticism uh one more Uh, sir, one more question has come from Mr. Jagjit Sahani. He is asking, "Ki sir, what is your advice to the young litigating lawyers during this COVID-19 situation?" Apart from other things which I have said, read more. That this is this is the time to study for young lawyers. Study, study, and study. Read, read, and read. Read law books. Read other material. Read philosophy. read economics a good lawyer has to be adept at all these things he must know something of all may not be a master of everything but he must know enough of all so read read and read increase your knowledge sharpen the knife uh sir uh, prano dhagat is asking so there are large number of pending cases in trial courts how can we deal with these cases during this covid time so the trial courts will have to find out how the point is to come back to life if you think that the courts will be functioning straight away immediately as it was functioning that may not happen so some suffering will always be there like the migrant workers are suffering so here also the lawyers and clients are suffering but there is no option of course there are people who think that there should have should not have been locked down one of them proponents of openness is uh, the president of the united states trump well that's a big debate but however now we have had almost will be having 40 days of lockdown so it will open up and it will be gradual for sure so we will have to bear the sufferings with a positive attitude uh miss aarti shankpal is asking sir what is your opinion regarding virtual courts I don't know technology in India how much this digital world exists. The virtual world is small. There is a huge digital divide. The bulk of the country in rural areas. I don't think so. It has very limited role to play for now. What role it will play in future, I don't know. I have forty-five years. I have spent arguing in court, so I can't imagine. advocacy in some other form but yes you young generation people you will be have to quickly get in tune with this new technologies which are emerging we will also try to trudge along as much as possible but for now virtual courts 
will have a limited role to play. That's how I see it. Uh, sir, Mr. Vaibhav Pratap Singh Surivanshi, he is asking how can junior lawyer can survive who is completely dependent upon him? Any duties lie on bar council or state bar? What are the duties of the state bar council for the junior lawyers? So I think bar council act provides for the bar council should have done something in advance, but nobody foresaw that Corona is coming. And as usual, in all departments, there has been some thing lacking. But Corona will teach us many things. So I think uh, the Bar Council will have to set up some funds with the help of the government and contributions from lawyers. And uh, so that in future, if some such thing happens, the young needy lawyers can be supported. Uh, so Mr. Rick Saha, he's asking, if the advocates pan India make a corpus and donate a little amount, it will give rise to a substantial amount. It is more like a suggestion whether advocates you know, throughout the India should make a corpus and donate. Yeah, that's what I was talking that bar council should start it off or um, otherwise every bar association will have to do it separately. Bar councils of the state and bar council of India will be in a better position perhaps. That should be done. Undoubtedly, it should be done. Uh, Akshay Sharma. But one thing more I would like to say is that uh, when we started practicing, the we were I was getting only two hundred rupees from the seniors. Yes, sir. We never thought of money. We always thought of grabbing as much knowledge as we could from the senior. That's true, sir. That's true. The way it so should be. So, gyan prapt kariye sabse badi wealth hai wo. And uh, in fact, I may tell you one incident that when my father came from a very backward area in the state of Uttar Pradesh, that is Bundelkhand, Hamirpur. You can imagine 1945, even today Bundelkhand is backward. So when he went to Allahabad High Court for practice, so in hard times, hard life, Build the funds, but also build your capacity to live with Chana. <laughs> Sir, Akshar Sharma is asking, uh, should we follow this lockdown thing in near future for the betterment of the earth? Follow the lockdown? Yes, sir. Whether we should follow this lockdown near future, in near future. I think this is a question for the government to decide with the help of economists, experts. How much our economy can sustain, how much lockdown, uh, we as lawyers don't have answer for this. Whether we should have another spell now or after a gap or all these are questions, difficult questions. So let's trust the government, let's, let's trust the Prime Minister and, uh, and the other state governments. They are doing good job as I can see, Kerala is turning around. Goa is doing better. In fact, there are only seven or let me tell as I see the statistics, only seven or eight states are there which are contributing for the overwhelming majority of these cases. So there is a lot of hope. There is some containment, there is some success. But ultimately, it's for government to decide. Uh, sir, Advocate Gitanshi Arora, she is asking, can you suggest some books for young advocates for the betterment of understanding? Some good law books. Law books. So, read Sirvai is monumental work on constitution law. I think this is the time when everybody should read constitution. In my times, I have found that not many lawyers uh, think of picking up the constitution of India and the books on constitution and the judgments on constitutional laws. So, read Sirvai, read history of India, the movement. And I, as I said earlier, also read also what uh, economists are saying. You must know your country, you must know where you live, you must know what you want of your country and where do you want to take the country to. 
So read all about all these things. If you want to read Indian philosophy, you read uh, Dr. S. Radhakrishnan's Indian philosophy. The president of India. He was a great philosopher. He has written a good, very good book in two volumes. Read that. And read other things. There are so many things to read. Read Aristotle, Plato, Kant. So many philosophers are there. Indian philosophers are also there. There were Indian historians also there. So read. Read okay, and sir. read. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Aman Marekar, he is asking, how can we maintain social distance in trial court after 3rd of May? How so can this, we maintain yes. this has to be worked out by the district bar, uh, by in touch with, getting in touch with the district judge. And uh, it's not impossible. If the, if the question is suggesting that it is not possible, I would say that it's possible. Supposing one case is called out, then that lawyer should go inside. No, but there should be no crowding. So one lawyer this side, one lawyer that side, and the judge is sitting with one or two, there are five or six people in the court. They finish the case, they come out. Then another case is called out, another person goes inside. It's possible to maintain distance. And then with precautions, mask and all that is possible. It's not impossible at all. Uh, and then sir, some risk. Yeah. Are, is it not that we fall ill all the time with so many other kind of diseases when we go out? So and 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 so these Kirana Walas and essential service providers, the policemen. After all, all of them are working and taking risks. So what is there? As it is, eighty percent of the people who are falling ill are young people, and they're. They are asymptomatic or very less symptoms and they are getting cured. It is the elderly people who have a problem. They are going out less, and, but there are more fatalities, more than 50%. So I think it's this another way is that keep the elderly people, lawyers out for some time. Focus on this younger generation, let them go. So it is possible. OK. So there's one more question from Mrs. Achana Patak Dave. She is asking, sir, there was a protest at Shaheen Bagh uh, before this lockdown period start. So and it was a violation of the fundamental right of many people. Should not be judiciary, should have quick, you know, uh, redress it very far, quickly, that problem of the protest at Shaheen Bagh. Oh, these are complex issues of uh, the right to protest and the other people's right to move. When two rights are clashing, balancing, and then the other things also, the courts don't want. Uh, courts say the police. What can the court say? Police lati charge, use force. If the some people don't uh, move out uh, by advice, by being nudged, then uh, the force has to be used. So the better course the court thought was to send a team to Shaheen Bagh to convince them. Mm -hmm. So now these are difficult, sensitive issues. Uh, maybe the courts could have asked them to wicket. But I, you can't find fault if the court made an effort to find a solution peacefully. These are all available alternatives. They will always be, you can do one thing, you can do another thing, and you can do a third thing also. And in fact, the police itself could have done it. I mean, where, where, why should the court come into it? Nothing prevented the police from, it's every time the police uses the force on its own discretion and not because the court asks the police to use the force. So there's a one more personal question of Mr. Zavi Kazagar. He is asking, sir, what about you? Are you how are you spending your time these days? So I'm uh, one. I am doing some cooking, learning to cook, and the other doing a, a regular exercises to keep fit. And third, 
I am reading books and uh, doing some writing work. I have read this Radha Krishna's Indian philosophy and uh, some other books I have read. So reading, books are the best companion and it's not so difficult to pass the time. Of course, you feel like we as human beings always want to do things which we are not when we are working, we are all the time looking for leisure. When we have leisure, we want to go out and work in the movie halls and so on. But I think there are a lot of things which can be done. You can learn music. I am not. Uh, Mr. Shovendu Anand is asking, sir, can you please share some interesting anecdotes about Keshan and Bharti K? Anecdotes, yeah, so since my father was on the bench, Justice S. N. Devedi, and uh, I had just joined law, so I was attending the Supreme Court from the first day of law first year. The, those days the classes used to be from 7 to 11, at 11.30 I used to come to the Supreme Court. So I heard all the senior lawyers who argued, including Mr. Palkiwala and Mr. Sirvai, Mr. Nirende. But uh, one anecdote was that a lot of judges had strong views about, uh, and they were very expressive also, on both sides. Pro-basic structure and against basic structure. So Palkiwala had a, I learned the court craft from him. You imagine uh, taking questions from 13 judges. When, when judges, he knew which judges are on what side. And when some judges who were against the basic structure thesis, which he was propounded, were putting questions. So he was not insultive, insulting, but uh, he used to take the questions, respond to them also. But sometimes I found that he used to just take out a notebook and then show as if he's taking down some questions or something. And he used to say that I, I have a separate argument on this and I will respond to it later on. And then he went on in his own way and did not deal with it. So this is very interesting battle which goes on between judges and lawyers. Sometimes the judges also uh, put some questions like this. They don't want you to go in the direction which you are taking, so they want to distract you from that. They will put questions, they may pester you also. The lawyer has to learn, which I learned from Mr. Palkiwala. So that was one of the incidents which I still remember. And then the other incident was uh, when the other side had to respond after Palkiwala finished. Then there was a big fight between Mr. H. M. Sirvai and Mr. Nirende as to who will start the argument for the respondents. So Nirende, as the Attorney General, had a right to begin. But Mr. Sirvai stood up and said that, no, he's standing for the state of Maharashtra as the Advocate General and uh, the law of the state has been challenged, so it is his right to. So ultimately, he prevailed and Mr. Nirende was softer and he gave way to Mr. Sirvai. And Mr. Sirvai led the argument. Later on, after the Raj, Rajnarayan Indra Gandhi case, if you will read his book on constitutional law, you will find that he switched sides and he became, he turned pro basic structure. So much against the arguments which he advanced, he switched. So these are the two which I remember. Uh, 
Okay, sir. Uh, here, answer some of uh, our viewers' question. Sir, thank you very much. I want to say thank you on behalf of the Adivakta Pasha that you spare your precious time, and you have cl clearly explained every aspect of the topic. And uh, as the old saying goes, all good things must come to an end. So we have to end this lecture on this. Thank you, thank you for calling me. Thank you, thank you for this opportunity and experience in the virtual world. Thank you. Okay, sir. And sir, I would also like to thank our technical team, including Shomendu, Aishanan, Vikramji, Shomendu, Arindu, are working very hard day and night under the direction of Hachiketa Ji and Santosh Ji to make this lecture successful. And uh, we, you would also, we would also request all our uh, and sister to subscribe our YouTube channel, Adivakta Prashad Official, and share this video as much as possible to Facebook and Twitter. Tomorrow we will have Vikramjit Banaji, additional solicitor general of India, as our next speaker, and we will be speaking on a completely different and new topic. Uh, now, in the end, I want to uh, quote one slok: "Ashwarya vibhushanam sujanta shor vakas sehumo gyan seyor pasham kulas vinyo vitas patre vayam." An affluent and rich person is adorned if he is kind. A powerful person adorned if he control over his speech. A learned person is adorned by his peace of mind, and the money spent is appreciative if, if it is for a worthy cause. Would request all my advocate, brother and sister to contribute to PM Care Fund as much as possible because this fight against the corona is not only for the present generation, but the future of the human civilization. Shubhratri.